and artificial intelligence to answer common questions about uh, that beginners have about Bitcoin and uh, maybe even some advanced users might want to dig into. So we'll be talking with Alex uh, throughout the show. Alex, feel free to jump in and steer the show. I, I do just kind of want to kick it off with the, the big story, which is, which is the same story as it's been for the last few weeks, almost every single day, but it's becoming clearer and more pronounced, which is the price of Bitcoin is going up because there's a lot of Bitcoin being bought, particularly by retail through the exchange traded funds that launched on January 11th. So we're now, we're now a full two months in, like two months and two days. Um, I think there was over a billion dollars of net inflows yesterday alone into the ETFs. Um, and so we don't know if that's people selling shares and other things um, or, or actual Bitcoin and exchange and trading into ETFs, but it, Certainly, the overwhelming majority of it seems to be coming as entirely new flows into Bitcoin, causing the price to get bid up. There, I do have this interesting question. I don't know, Alex, or anybody else who's on stage here, if you've got to take the price action, really actually, the upwards price action in particular, seems to be particularly taking place not during Wall Street market hours. It seems to be taking place overnight for those of us who live in the Western hemisphere or very early in the morning. Um, and so I, I don't know exactly what the cause of that is. I don't know if the ETFs are delegating the actual settlement and purchase of their Bitcoins uh, to those off market hours, or if there's actually a lot of activity in Asia and Europe that's, uh, that's maybe putting a good amount of bidding against uh, perhaps a thinner order book. I, I don't actually know. And I don't know anyone who does, but if anyone has... I, I, I know exactly what's happening. Oh, there we go. It's so good to have you here today, Alex. Yeah, I, I, I just books. call Satoshi I, every night and just tell him to yeah. pump the price. That's basically oh, okay. that's how it works. Where does he get the money? I, I mean, look, that doesn't matter, Toma. This is this is Bitcoin we're talking about. It's a Ponzi scheme. And all I've got to do is just make the call to Satoshi and he makes the price go up. Didn't you know that? Yeah, uh, No, I did not. Well, it's, it's good to know. That's it. That's uh, that's how we're all getting rich. Sometimes we get serious answers on the show, but mostly we don't. Mostly not. I'm a serious man, all right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, you know, it, it, there's a lot of mysteries in Bitcoin, and this is another great mystery in Bitcoin. I don't hear anyone complaining, except for Peter Schiff. Uh, I, I don't hear anyone complaining that the price uh, seems to be going up regardless of the hour uh, that it goes up in. Uh, so. <laughs> that is that uh, is what it is. Well, I do know that on the weekend, we, we MicroStrategy had been buying eight hundred million dollars worth of Bitcoin. But the, again, the price didn't move all that much over the weekend. It was kind of as we've seen in the last three weeks. Now there's this Monday morning pump before markets open, and it's a it's a nice way to start the week. Um, I kind of I'm starting to get to like Mondays. So the Bob Geldof song is off for me right now. Uh, I'll just say good morning to everybody, and we can ma we can maybe talk a little bit about the details about the ETFs, but I, but then we can jump straight into this new project you're working on, Alex, and and get uh, and get going. So good morning, Brady, Terrence, uh, and Jacob, and, and again to you, Alex. How's everybody doing this morning? It hasn't been that long since we logged off the last Twitter Spaces that ended at midnight Eastern last night. Damn, you guys like to live on Twitter. Jesus, I, 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 I like do spaces really, really, really sporadically these days. Um, fine, though, I, I guess I'm busy with other shit. But, you know, it's, it's always good to come back to a spaces after, um, after a while. I, I miss a lot of the voices. It's a, it's a place to hang out with friends and talk about things that you're compulsively obsessed with. It really is. Hey, Tomer, just to... Um, answer your question. My understanding is that uh, in general, the reason we're seeing all the off-market activities because all of the authorized participants, the you know market makers for each ETF, are having to settle up on the shares. So if the demand has been pretty strong during market hours, they're they're having to purchase the Bitcoin that they've been selling um, to the investors. Um, am I wrong in that thinking? We're probably all wrong on everything that we're thinking, so I, I don't want to come across as saying you're wrong and, and I've got an alternative hypothesis that's right. When I was speaking to um, 
the CTO of uh, the Bitwise uh, fund uh, at Madeira. He said, you know, there's constant buying and selling as these players hedge their bets. They don't just take hang out with a huge risk there that there's a ton of buying and there's a ton of purchasing and, and, and that it doesn't execute. So there's a lot of stuff going on in the market. Between 3 and 4 p.m. Eastern time is when the uh, APs are supposed to place their order for new units or redemption of units with the ETF uh, entities. And again, I really think it would be wonderful if we could find some people who could uh, clearly explain this. But but the take that I got was there is flexibility for the ETFs and for the market makers as to precisely when they, they do all their purchasing and settling, but that they're generally purchasing and selling a lot throughout the day so that they don't get exposed to this big risk because if they have to buy a thousand bitcoin and the price has moved the, the retail price has moved favorably a thousand dollars on them they're a, a million bucks um so they, they need to keep it close in there and, and you know this is razor tight margins and very liquid markets i think one really really interesting um aspect of this is recognizing like when we just had the crypto exchanges trading bitcoin and over the counter desks it was very hard to tell how much liquidity was in bitcoin well we know that there is a huge amount of liquidity now because what's tra trading in these bitcoin etfs a lot of it is trading through you know it is real it, it it's essentially all real trades with real liquidity I mean, if you wanted to sell an actual bitcoin there's for cash, there's an ETF buying that actual Bitcoin for cash or the market maker for the ETF buying that Bitcoin for cash. And we're talking about billions of dollars a day just in the activity that they're generating. So there's so much liquidity right now. Um, it'd be really interesting to see a good estimate of how much liquidity there is and how close it might be getting to gold or how much it might have surpassed something like silver as another store of value commodity that that gets traded on exchanges. Brady, I see you've got your hand up. Maybe you want to add something to this. Hey, good morning, Tomer. Good morning, Alex. It's good to see you again. It was uh, you too, my friend. Really nice to catch up with you yesterday. Um, and I can't wait to talk about your project. Uh, I just wanted to talk about the CNBC clip that's gone viral about uh, with Sailor and people taking it out of context and stopping it right at the point where he says we call them poor, making memes and songs and jokes about it, watching Bitcoiners laugh about this, um, has really made me kind of sick, uh, honestly. And that's not what he was talking about at all. Um, and we can play the clip here in a second, but if you listen to the rest of the context after that comment, you know, where he says, we have a name for them, we call them poor, uh, it, he talks about how the fiat monetary system is completely broken. It killed the store value property of money so long ago at this point. And he's explaining that the, that the system is rigged in favor of the rich because of that fact. And wealth inequality has become relentlessly concentrated. Or wealth, let me just put it this way. Wealth has become relentlessly more concentrated since 1971. And I nested a tweet that I made this morning that has a chart that you can take a look at that you know, makes this completely clear, as uh, this fact completely clear. And so if you're forced to save in dollars, you're just not going to make it, right? Your inflation is going to crush you. If you have enough wealth or had enough wealth in the early 70s and 80s, and you were able to build some up, you were able to save in scarce assets like real estate and equities and, be, and you're able to outpace inflation, right? So the wealth just concentrates to the rich and the poor get poor because of inflation. So that's what he was talking about. And I think taking that out of context for a joke is kind of heartless, but it's also like not good <laughs> for Sailor. Like it makes him look like a greedy, heartless, you know, capitalist pig kind of kind of person, right? Um, and he's not that. Yes, he's an extremely rich man, but he believes that Bitcoin is a better money and can change the world and, and and that's one of the reasons he's ha so passionate about it. Uh, of course, you know, it's going to make him a, gajil a gajillionaire, so that doesn't hurt either. But, uh, you know, just listening to him, he understands that this is important, uh, not just, you know, not just to make him rich. Um, well, so anyway, just wanted, I just we, wanted to say that we can listen to the clip too, uh, Tom. I was just going to say, J Jacob was having some trouble with the audio for the music earlier, so he may be having the same trouble with playing the clip. Are you able yeah. to play the clip, Jacob? Yeah, I can play it now. 
Oh, okay, great. So, so let's play it. Let's hear Michael Saylor speak for himself, and not and not cut him out of context. I have another tweet I want to read from another billionaire afterwards. It's it's maybe in the same vein. Uh, so, let's hear it. Is there a price at which you would consider selling some of the Bitcoin, pulling out? So, I mean, because you don't, you can do something with New York City. You can live in New York City. You can have a business in New York City. You, you know, wh what do you do with the Bitcoin besides it just gather value? Well, um, the proper real estate developers in New York City, uh, they're not buying the real estate because they want to live in it. They're buying the real estate because they expect Well, because they want to sell it eventually, desirable. Michael. I mean, let's be honest. Most of the people who are, uh, yes, sure, some people pass it on to their children. But, like, most of the people who are buying assets at some point want to sell the assets at a profit. So let, I me, guess, let me say it a different way. Okay. People that use fiat currency as a store of value, there's a name for them. We call them poor. Okay. Uh, anybody that's rich in the world, they own property. They own they own large swathes of land. The royal family of England, it didn't sell all of its property in central London in order to buy, uh, you know, currency or paper money. Nor did the royal family of uh, of Japan. Nor did the royal family in the Middle East. In fact, they they want to own the property forever. I I I want to want you to imagine Bitcoin is. It's a city in cyberspace that's 276 blocks wide, 276 blocks high, 276 blocks deep, about 21 million blocks. Now imagine all 8 billion people in the world want to live there one day. They want to put their capital there. There's $900 trillion of, of wealth in the world. As people migrate from, uh, from every other form of property and they've assets into cyberspace, you're going to see the Bitcoin network go from a trillion dollar network to a 10x that to a 100x that. And there really is nowhere else to go. It is the apex property of the human race. That's, that's, I'm, I'm really glad we play that because it puts a focus. There's a very funny clip going around and it is fun and funny. And I, I appreciate why when you've listened to the whole thing, Brady, it can get under your skin because it's a, it is a complete distortion of the message that, uh, that sailor is trying to put out there. Right. And I, and another nice new metaphor from him, uh, this, uh, city in cyberspace made out of 200 or 21 million blocks, um, that everybody wants to be, to own some, some of that, some share of that property. Um, he's, he's found the cube root of 21 million, I guess, at 726 or whatever that number was, uh, and and multiplied it through. So I do think that's very fair uh, to set that set that context in motion for him. I, I wanted to read a, a tweet from um, from an even richer billionaire, Elon Musk, uh, who's who seems to be getting pretty concerned about what's going on in this space. He says these scam coins are getting crazy. One someone just chilled me colon 27 trillion in circulation unlimited supply cap only one node 25 percent of supply minted in the last six months one percent of holders own 30 percent of it just kidding that's the u.s dollar so that's that's elon musk pointing out the flip side of this coin that uh the taylor's pointing out right it's like fiat is uh, is basically a scam coin as, as uh, to quote elon musk um, and, and, and Bitcoin isn't. And so this, this incredible contrast that's being realized by incredibly wealthy individuals who don't want to store their wealth in the dollar, right? And, and are, are likely increasingly, I can't speak entirely on behalf of Elon Musk right now, but, you know, he's likely increasingly seeing the value proposition of Bitcoin as a store of wealth. And we've seen Larry Fink talk about Bitcoin as a store of wealth. And, and this, this is, this is today's leading narrative because it's so easy for people to understand. There's so many nuances and other aspects of the rabbit hole of Bitcoin. But the, uh, the, this particular aspect that it is the greatest store of wealth we've seen because it doesn't leak. It doesn't require expense to maintain it. Right? Like If you buy real estate, if you buy one of these New York City properties, you've got to actually collect rent to keep the value. You've got to maintain the building. You've got to buy insurance. You've got to do all of these things. The activity to maintain the, the wealth in the store of wealth is huge. With Bitcoin, you put it in cold storage and you forget about it.
hopefully you don't forget your seed phrase, uh, you've got it written down somewhere, but you, you don't have to spend a dime or a Satoshi to keep your coins in cold storage. And if you want added safety, you can pay very de minimis amounts to have collaborative custodial solutions with two or three signatures and all this kind of stuff. But it's all, it's all a very, very inexpensive way to store your value. So that to me is the big, big, big thing here. We'll take, we'll take one or two more questions. Then I, I certainly, you know, Alex is joining us. So I want to turn our attention to his project really soon. I saw Lisa pop up on the stage. Turn the mic to her. Sure. And then Don. Is anyone speaking or can I not hear them? No. Lisa, was there something you wanted to add? If not, we'll turn to Don of the New Empire. I'm sorry. Good morning. No, I was just listening. Thanks, okay. guys. Good morning. So, Don, why don't you hit us with your comment or question, and then we'll start to turn this over to Alex. Thing like um, profound to say, other than um, I spent like over five minutes trying to find um, Swan um, today. Uh, there's nothing, you know. With the Is it just me, or can we not hear anyone? No, you know what, Alex? I can hear Don, so you may be. There's a problem with spaces that happens from time to time. It's best if you drop and, and ask to come back up. And if you do, we'll get you back, right back up here and it'll kind of reset your listening stage. Basi whatever. Basically, spaces is a piece of shit, Alex. Sorry. It's so annoying. Yeah, I just, it is, um, when you go to your down the side birch uh, spaces that are on right now, Swan isn't on there. The other ones are, but Swan isn't on there. So uh, you basically, uh, it's really hard to try and find, you know, un unless you're following somebody. And even then, when you, when I clicked on Swan, it didn't show that there was a spaces running. I actually needed to go onto your page in order for it to show that it was actually, uh, the spaces was on. Well, you know, I wish there was something we could do about that, but short of booting everybody out and restarting it, I, I guess there's, there's a lot of spaces that started earlier that probably have significant listener counts and Twitter only displays maybe the top three or four for some people. Uh, so it's, it's, an in, it's a more intimate crowd uh, today. I, I do see that we still have over 250 uh, active listeners right now, so that's not, uh, that's not too bad, and I'm sure that there are other shows going on. But thanks for the heads up. There's just, I just don't think there's anything we can do about it. Technical glitches and and what and whatnot are all here. But thanks for the heads up, Alex. We've got you back up here now. Do you want to introduce your project um, and tell us a little bit about the journey, or however you want to talk about it? We've got forty minutes left in the show. Sure. Um, I, I just want to say thanks to Brady for for bringing that up because I think something you know that drives me crazy about social media is like how much of the shit gets taken out of context and you know th there is like you know the, the memes and everything like that that happens in bitcoin is you know usually funny but I, I do think a lot of the time we do ourselves a disservice by looking like a bunch of clowns um and i think you know there is a time and a place to be funny and you know there, there's also a time and a place to just be a little bit more mature so um yeah just good so can i just ask that, who are you and what have you done with the real alex Svetsky? uh i killed him <laughs> I got older. Give me a break. Um, so, uh, to answer your previous question, um, so for the last year and a bit, um, me and a team of Bitcoiners have been messing around with um, with language models, and we've been trying to build something um, a little unique, which is uh, a a Bitcoin centric language model. So, and and what what this means is it's not like People run around and say, "Oh, you know, I trained a model on my own data," um, which is a which is a fallacy. It's kind of like um, you know when you hear people say that, "Oh, you know, Bitcoin and crypto is the same thing." Um, nobody trains their model on their own data. What they do is they take their data, they do what's called a vectorization process. So they turn um, you know their information, their data, their essay, their book, you know, their tweets, whatever, into um, numbers that are readable by a language model. Then they have a generic language model reference um, that essentially uh, machine readable database and it um, you know gives you a more contextually accurate answer but 
the model itself hasn't been retrained. And what that means is that all the models out there, whether it's ChatGPT, open source, closed source, doesn't matter, they're, they're all essentially this, you know, trained off the same sort of corpus of like what I call Wikipedia data. So they represent the normie model of the world, you know, the midwit, middle of the bell curve, um, inflation at 2% is good uh, model of the world. We took it upon ourselves to try and do something different, which is to take uh, an existing um, language model or try even from scratch, but we realized going from scratch was just way too hard. So we took an existing open source model and we tried to entrain or embed a new bias uh, into it. And that new bias being uh, basically the Austrian economic Bitcoin model of the world. So that's what we've been doing for like uh, the last year. And, um, you know, the experimentation process and everything has been uh, quite um quite out there, like we, we've spoken with, um, you know, people from Google, Facebook, like all, all, all the big sort of like AI things and, and they're all like, you know, fry their noodle sort of thing. It's like, oh, well, why, why don't you just, you know, train your model on like, um, you know, all, all of the stuff that's in Wikipedia on Bitcoin. And it's like, well, no, because, you know, Bitcoin is extremely nuanced. You know, there's a, there's a different model of the world that uh, it uh, represents. So we're trying to take out the normie, model of the world and, uh, and embed a new one. And we've had some success, not, not the greatest success. Um, it, you know, it's still a work in progress. But to sort of bring it to the 21 Questions uh, book that we're going to chat about today is um, we decided to take the current version or the latest version of the model that we have. And part of what we did in the training process was we uh, basically trained it across um, thousands and thousands and thousands of uh, Bitcoin questions. And we distilled and weighted those thousands of questions into a top 21 and, you know, like 21 most common, pertinent um, and important as people are starting out their journey. And we answered each of those 21 questions with the model. And then we decided, you know what, let's like turn it into like a little, like a book. So we rounded up a bunch of Bitcoin thinkers, you know, Tomer obviously included and, you know, your, your Jack Mazzucos and your Nat Brunels and, you know, Samson Mao and Guy Swan and you know, a bunch of other people. I think there's like 10, 10 contributors or something. And we basically, yeah, got the, the top 21 questions. We answer them with the spirit of Satoshi, which is the uh, AI character that we, we, that we built. Um, and um, with all these Bitcoin thinkers. And it's, we just made like a little beginner's book and it's super, super easy to, um, to read. Like, and you know, the, the, the premise of it is that when people come into Bitcoin, uh, and they first discover it, they have questions, right? And, you know, they come and they seek out answers to those questions on the web, on this, on that, etc. And, you know, they could come to Spirit of Satoshi and it's kind of like a global repository of all of the stuff that's ever been written and said about Bitcoin. So it's like a good way to do it. But, you know, books are never going to go away. And we thought it would be a cool way to um, distill some essence of uh, what's in the uh, quote-unquote mind of the spirit of Satoshi and the mind of, um, you know, the best Bitcoin contributors out there um, into uh, into a format that is just easily readable. You just open it on any page and, you know, you've got the question there and, uh, and a, a really beautiful answer about, um, about Bitcoin, you know, and the related question. And the, the goal here is we're going to do, like, a whole series of these. So we'll do, like, you know... Um, Bitcoin, uh, sorry, 21 questions, the lightning edition, we'll do 21 questions, the macro edition, we'll do 21 questions, the, um, the Nostra edition, maybe we'll even do like 21 questions, homeschooling edition and like carnivore edition, whatever, right? So it like kind of, you know, opens up a door for like, um, using this model for educating different things. So that's kind of the premise and 21 questions is basically like a first attempt at, um, you know, producing something with this model, um, and seeing, seeing where it goes. Fascinating. So uh, how do you feel about, like, have you, when you compare the spirit of Satoshi's responses to Bitcoin questions to chat GPT's responses, or, I mean, you can, you can talk about Google Gemini or uh, mm -hmm. Twitter, Twitter's Grok as well. Are you seeing a, a substantial difference? Like if you ask, what's the difference between Bitcoin and crypto? You, what you typically get from chat GPT? I know because we, we ask this question on job applications and you can quickly tell who's using chat GPT. Yeah. <laughs> they, they say Bitcoin is one of many cryptos. Uh, yes. Crypto is a broader, is a broader uh, field than just Bitcoin. But mm -hmm. That's not the answer mm -hmm. I'm looking for. Correct. So great, um, great question. And basically that is the biggest difference between um, Spirit Satoshi and 
ChatGPT, Gemini, insert mainstream language model, is that our one will tell you um, there is Bitcoin and there is shitcoin, and you know it, it'll do it in a more nuanced way, obviously. Um, but it'll it'll describe uh, the difference and. The, the challenge we've had, because just to give you an idea, like our model in terms of size is like the moon in comparison to the sun when we compare it to ChatGPT. So in terms of parameter size, right? So it's it's way fucking smaller. I don't I don't have a million dollars a day to burn on um on compute uh, like OpenAI does. So you know we we're obviously working with uh, with a lot less. So our model is not as conversationally adept. As a chat GPT, so like with chat GPT, you can have a discussion, at least until it tells you there's 37 genders and, you know, then it starts like blocking you from asking anything else. But essentially, like, um, ours is like shorter, shorter responses, more Bitcoin accurate responses. And when I say Bitcoin accurate, Bitcoin accurate in, in terms of what we understand. The, the, the best way to describe that is exactly what you just said earlier, Tomer. It's like, you're not looking for that answer of, oh, yeah, you know, Bitcoin is part of crypto. And like, our response will be uh, will be very different. So that's that's the essence of what we want to do. Once we get that figured out, the goal will be to then take that data set, that process and everything and train larger and larger models that can have um, better conversational abilities. And that's where things get potentially interesting is you might we might be able to you know produce a more quote unquote based Bitcoin model um, for use in, you know, embedding in other applications and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. so, so tell me, uh, you know, it, it sounds like the biggest challenge is, is getting, <laughs> getting the kind of answers that where you don't already have the answer provided by somebody that, that is an answer that you feel is contextually or from a nuanced perspective, correct. And, and, and that that does remain a challenge, it sounds like. Do, do you have any thoughts on how you might be able to overcome these challenges or, or where do the challenges most arise? Yeah. Well, one thing we've learned, so a lot of the, um, the AI space is basically like Wizard of Oz, um, Smoke and Mirrors. Like it really is um, like the, the, the best people in AI um, you know, are coming out today and basically just saying, we actually don't know what the fuck's going on. We don't know how we got here. We don't know what we're doing. Um, it is 90% art and 10% science, right? Like, so so the guy, Jeremy, I forgot his surname, but the guy who literally developed the process of pre-training, fine-tuning, and uh, reinforcement learning as a three-step process to training models, which is what all of the major models uh, have used as the standard to build models, came out about two and a half months ago and said, yeah, you know what? Um, that's bullshit uh, because what we found in the last uh, two years of doing this shit is that we actually don't know. Uh, we, we can't repeat anything. So there's this funny meme that Alan Farrington shared um, a couple months ago, which is like the AI process. And it's like this big cauldron of like soup cauldron where there's like, you know, data is the ingredients being fed and someone's like stirring the pot basically. And what pops out the other side is like, this is AI, you know? So it's like the, the, the whole process is very like, experimentational like we i remember the first model that we produced um you know gave like basically punked us we thought we were on the right track we're like fuck all right we figured it out because the first model we did was actually quite good and then we copied the same process we added to the data set we turned the next model and it was a piece of shit and we were just sitting there scratching our heads thinking i, I don't understand and you know we've trained like 50 models now um and we've We've found some patterns that help work, but like I said, it's like 90% um, art and 10% science. So, um, yeah, it, like I, I'm, I've even come to the opinion almost that what ChatGPT has done and the reason why Google and none of these guys can really compete was 50-50 like fluke and um, and skill, like or may, maybe even 80-20 fluke and skill, like because no, no, like. Google has all the resources on the planet to be able to do something. Anthropic raised four billion, five billion dollars, and they cannot match uh, the quality of. Um, yeah, and you know, ChatGPT's got all its problems, but it's still by far the best uh, conversational 
uh, language model out there by fucking far. Like it's not even, it's not even a, you know, the, the evaluations that you see popping up on Twitter and stuff like that are total scams because what they do with the evaluations, they pick a set of 500 questions or whatever it is. Um, the evaluation is not even done by humans. The evaluation is done by another language model, um, which first of all, you know, makes the thing, you know, really questionable. But second of all is the questions that they evaluate on uh, selected in such a way that the model that they trained has been trained more on those questions. So you basically are picking a sliver and your, your, you know, evaluations are just like a really biased, uh, viewpoint on the model's, um, general capabilities. So long way of saying is that the challenge is not, um, so it's not exactly what you said, but but it's related to that in the sense that you are consistently, uh, basically playing black magic with these models to create uh, weightings and word associations, which you don't really even know how that works on the inside. Um, and doing that multiple, multiple, multiple times until something pops out um, that is, you know, good. And the probably the greatest lever that we've had in this whole process is like really, 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 really distilled quality data. So you can't just, for example, take a podcast transcribe the whole podcast and train the model on the whole podcast because you fuck up the model because there's stuff in the podcast that is unrelated to asking Bitcoin uh, questions and answering Bitcoin questions. So you have to take the podcast. You have to literally strip out all of the nonsense about what you have for breakfast and, you know, fucking, you know, how are you doing today? What was last week? You know, like all of the conversational stuff. You need to extract just the Bitcoin elements and then you need to transform them into question and answers if you want the model to respond in questions and answers and you need to like basically from a whole podcast which might you know be 10,000 words or 20,000 words you might actually extract only 500 words or a thousand words that are relevant for training the model and that process of like distilling and you know bring everything down that's where all the work and effort and time and energy goes um and then yeah you then toss it into the cauldron and uh, hope for the best, basically. So, <laughs> hope for the best. I, I, I think this is interesting. Like, we use the term artificial intelligence, and so we, as, we, we ascribe the word intelligence, which is a difficult-to-define word. The, perhaps a more accurate description of these things, one, one is large language models, but even more precise is a predictive mathematical model of words that would be answered in response to the words that were posed as, as a question. <sighs> Hundred percent, one hundred percent. People, people got punked. They thought these were thinking machines, and you know, I've I've written about this. Uh, you know, I, I came to realize this relatively quickly. Is that the AI thing is not special. The only thing we've had is a breakthrough in realizing that we can apply patterns um, and the law of large numbers probabilities to word associations. That's literally all we've done. So, and, and it just seemed in the beginning because before language models, the only thing that ever talked back to you was a fucking parrot, right? You could teach a parrot to say, I'm going to take over the world and kill all humans, right? And you're not going to freak out. But like you, you can basically get a machine to regurgitate the same sort of thing because the, the, the big breakthrough that happened a number of years ago was the ability to codify through numbers uh, word meanings, right? And and what I'm what I'm getting at, and this is becoming a bit of a AI technical show, but uh, I'll, I'll explain this and then I'll leave it there. Is um, we worked out how to take a word um, and vectorize it, meaning is turning it into a number. And these numbers are you know mathematically multi-dimensional. I think you know modern embeddings have like two thousand dimensions uh, of numbers, so so the word is like quite you know complex in in the, in the number space. Um, but by doing that, um, you're able to uh, have two words, for example, like cat and hat. In traditional search uh, and traditional machine learning, cat and hat had more of a relationship because, you know, they're three words and they're very close and just the C and the H are different, etc. But in this new sort of uh, the vectorization of meaning of words and sentences and letters and everything, uh, cat and hat are spatially really distant. They're, they're, they're not very close because they're two different things. Whereas cat and dog um, or cat and rhino, for example, are much closer in the vector word space. So this is this is basically what we figured out with, um, this is basically what the breakthrough in the AI space is, is that we have applied the you know probabilities and computation to word associations and patterns, and these uh, these products, these machines, these large language models are able to basically regurgitate some uh, contextually or semantically relevant um, 
uh, string of words in such a way that it makes it look like uh, the machine understands or can think or can produce something. But it can't. It's, it's still Wizard of Oz, uh, you know, behind the curtain. And, and that's really important to understand because a lot of people, you know, look at this, they're like, okay, it's thinking, okay, well, you know, we've got Neuralink coming and then tomorrow we're going to be taken over by the machines and the machines are going to do everything for us. And eh, wrong. You know, at best, the, you know, language models will obsolete midwits because midwits already have no fucking agency. They're already NPCs. They're, they already don't think for themselves. And the shit that comes out of their mouth is as if it's coming out of a robot. So, you know, at best, you know, the nerds just obsolete at the midwits. But anyone who's got a brain, who's got an opinion, who's got, like, who can think for themselves, who's got some creativity, it's going to be the best time to be alive. AI is not replacing any of that shit um, anytime soon. And, you know, it just, just opens up really interesting opportunities for um, for sentient beings, uh, which is what I assume everyone on this call is. This is a, this is a very interesting topic. I think we, we've moved a little bit above the topic of, of what the book is trying to cover and, and to this issue, this really interesting question that a lot of people have on their minds, which is where is AI headed and what will it be a good tool for it? There, there are a number of people who leap straight into, listen, this is, this is the next big thing and it will solve all problems. And that may be true, but we have to assign only a probability of significantly less than 100% to that. We just don't know that for certain. And, and we've seen, like, this isn't the first instance of AI. AI has been serving ads to us on the internet for, for well over a decade, probably closer to two decades, and you know, finding out your preferences and what you're most likely to click on based off of what other people are likely to click on. And it's the same type of technology. It's this vectorized, highly, high-dimensional weighted space of, of variables that, that lead it to making good decisions and optimizing the likelihood of selling you something or getting you to interac interact with something. It's what fuels the YouTube recommendation algorithm. It's what fuels the feed, the Twitter for you feed algorithm. But what's really kind of breakthrough about this, these large language models is they, they speak in English. Uh, they don't just present pieces of content in front of you that someone else created. It feels like they're creating their own sentences. And so it, it does give that illusion of intelligence up until you ask it a question where you're trying to ask it to solve a problem that hasn't been solved before or where the answer may be a controversial one or it may be nuanced or it may be an answer that is politically out of favor and, and somehow the model has been tuned to, to give you something else. And well, I, at that point, it's not tuning. At that point, it's just filtering. So, so they, they have two problems exactly. It's, it's the tuning and then it's the filtering over the top, which is where you get like all the, eh, sorry, like the Roomba effects, right? Like it just hits the wall and it doesn't we tell you anything else. Right. We won't, we won't answer anything else. But I, I, the, the bigger question for me is, you know, as someone who loves to see new technology help us, but has also seen promises made by new technologies that have gone unfulfilled. I, the example I think of is, uh, self-driving automobiles, right? Like this has been something that, again, over a decade ago was promised to be right around the corner, even by Google, right? They had this car driving around California that was apparently on the verge of being self-driving and, and certainly Tesla poured billions of dollars into it. Apple just very recently, allegedly, rumoredly, abandoned their automobile creation efforts, largely on the basis of the fact that this was too hard a problem to solve, building a self-driving car, um, and it's all these edge cases like in the real world, like, in the real world, life, like intelligent beings, you and I, and you, but even animals and plants, the, the training happens through, through evolution, essentially, right? Like you, you either, you're confronted with a problem and if you don't solve it, you die. Uh, if you do solve it, you live and you have the solution to the problem oversimplified. So nature is a very brutal trainer of, in, of intelligence. Uh, whereas you know, if, if chat GPT gives a wrong answer, maybe I die, but it continues to live because uh, I'm the one taking its advice. So there isn't that self corrective mechanism of answers that don't best in. Did we lose summer? Yeah, just for a second, a, a, ah. a spam call came in from WhatsApp. I should, I forgot to put my phone on Do Not Disturb, which I'm going to do right this second, and that won't happen again. 
So, so I, I was just saying, like, the, the, we're dealing, you know, we're trying to model something mathematically, and that, that's a model of aspects of the real world, and and that's just generally really, really impossible. Like, even for us, we have models of the real world. They're not perfect. They're far from perfect. People make mistakes all the time and have to suffer the consequences of making those mistakes because they can't, they can't get the full picture. And I think that's another fallacious uh, hope that many of us have of, of artificial intelligence, that it will somehow have all the information in the world. It can't even have all the information in an ice cube, right? The, the amount of matter and electricity and energy and uh, ambient effects and chaos and dynamism that takes place in a simple ice cube that you would put in the cup is, exceeds all the computational power of the universe. So you can model it reasonably accurately, but you can't model it perfectly. And if you're starting to model something like the whole global economy of all the human beings in the world interacting with each other, making decisions, having conversations, falling in love, you're not going to get it perfect. It, it, there just isn't, there isn't a way to do it. So never going to happen. Exactly. Really well put. Yeah. So I, I think, I think that there's this, there's this hope that machines will solve something that machines are in no position to solve. And, and that's not to say that I think the whole field of AI is, is bogus. I think that there's obviously a lot of benefits. We get the ability to quickly create uh, accompanying illustrations to articles, is something I take advantage of all the time. The ability to assist, to be a crutch in thinking about how to write something, give me some bullet points, give me some suggestions, give me some rhyming words, give me more vocabulary around this stuff. It's a very handy tool that's much faster, a replacement for things like a thesaurus and an encyclopedia and other things. So it's very efficient at doing some things really well, uh, but there's there's limits, and the more the more we try to give it, to presume it has godlike powers, the further and further we get from what what it's capable of doing right now, and ultimately what it's probably going to be capable of doing, even in its mature state. But it's an exciting time to live in right now because you don't know exactly what it can or can't or will or won't do, and uh, and there's a lot of experimentation going on. You know, I think the the biggest benefit is there's a lot of human beings experimenting with it in the real world and trying things, and some of them succeeding and some of them failing, and and the, that learning experience is something that may train the system to be better, or it may just be we learn how to use the existing system better. Both of those things improve the impact of AI on on our civilization, especially if we share those learnings. And, and that's, that's, I think, something that you're trying to do here uh, as much as anything else, Alex, right? It's like, here's what worked, here's what didn't. Here's where we think we can use this, here's where we haven't figured out how to use it yet. Absolutely. And, and I just want to say that that is one of the best takes um, possible on all of this um, because, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm in the weeds, in the technical weeds, and I can 100% like say that your intuitive um, explanation there is, is spot on. And, and fundamentally, these things, as you said, they're, they're useful insofar as you understand that they're a tool. Um, and, you know, as with all tools... Um, they, you know, their utility is enhanced by the user, and um, we are the agents uh, that use these tools. Um, and how we use them uh, will determine, you know. Uh, we I've just lost that one. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, you went. You went away for a second, but now we're I, I, I just, I just got spammed as well. <laughs> I gave him your number. I said, leave me alone. Bother this. Guy. Thanks a lot, man. <laughs> um, so, yeah, anyway, uh, basically what I was saying is that was just a really good way of, um, of framing it. And fundamentally, it's it's how we use these things um, and not over, like, over promise. Um, and this is, you know, exactly as what you said with the, um, with the self-driving cars. It's like, you know, you have these, like... You know, we, we, we over-index or over-project uh, what is possible. Um, and then, you know, people sort of have these false promises and false ideas in their head about what can be possible. And then they orient themselves in a, you know, in a really stupid way, thinking that, you know, this is the way things are going to work. And then, you know, we end up with, with bad decisions, which, look, I mean, you know, that's the market. You know, people have to experiment, you know, make a mess and do all this sort of stuff. So I'm, so I'm not against that. I guess I'm just here to say that, 
um, there's a lot less magic here and a lot more um, just probability and statistics. Um, and you know, if if you understand that, then and and you hear that and you're listening to this, you can make better decisions because you understand this more as a tool and not as a as another sentient being. Um, and you know, then then you can actually use it accurately, appropriately, and effectively. Yeah. Uh, natural intelligence is still a huge mystery. We do. Totally. As it's always so going to be a mystery. Right? Yeah. I, I think one of the things that where, you know, we, we say, we say in the Bitcoin community, be humble. Uh, and I think the reason it's bringing humility back into things is so important is we, we have developed as a, as a species over the last 400 years, so many scientific theories that work so well in certain contexts, right? Like you can, you can launch a cannonball out of a cannon, you know exactly the density of gunpowder that you had and the angle of attack, and you know exactly where that cannonball will hit, or you can <laughs> take it to a more advanced thing and build a, and build a rocket and, and, and have it like land on Mars. Uh, talk about precision of a ballistic thing. So we have some models that are extremely accurate, but again, they're, they're not perfectly accurate. We, we understand in some cases in what contexts they're not accurate. And we certainly don't think that the, the the theory of physics can explain what word will come next out of my mouth. Uh, it's it, they're just they they apply in different contexts and they're limited even within their own context. And so we become arrogant and think we can solve for everything, and then we're all frustrated. There's problems in the world. Why didn't we solve for everything? This this was supposed to fix that. That was supposed to fix this. Um, and, and so we play, many people place their bets on the next technology is the thing that's going to, or the next field of science that's going to fix everything or cure everything. And I, again, I, I welcome people's efforts. I just, I recognize, I, I, I recognize that utopia is usually unachievable with all of these things. You, you can't build a perfect model. You can't build a perfect predictive model. You can't solve all these problems because new ones arise that weren't predicted by the previous Situation. It, makes, it makes me think of two things. One is the anecdote from, um, you know, the Matrix and sort of the, you know, where Smith is talking to Morpheus when they first um, taken captive and he's like, you know, we, we tried to build, the first Matrix was the perfect world, there was no problems. And, you know, you humans uh, woke up from it, you couldn't uh, accept uh, that that was reality. And, you know, th that, that, that is a, you know, it's a meme, but it's so fundamentally true because I think the biggest fallacy and, you know, now we're getting all philosophical here, but is that we're, we're supposed to have problems, you know, problems are a sign of life. Um, and, you know, sort of, yeah, I, I learned that one from Tony Robbins is that like, if, if you don't have problems, um, you know, you're probably like dead and buried. Like the whole point of life is to have problems. And, and I don't mean just like stupid petty problems, like life gets better when you increase the quality of problems. So, and, and I think that's such an important distinction is that it's not about eliminating problems. It's about elevating to a higher quality of problem and continuing to do that. Like a, a low quality problem is, fuck, I don't have enough food to survive uh, until tomorrow, right? That's a really shitty problem. Whereas, you know, a higher quality of problem is, uh, what are the correct uh, mathematical coordinates to land a rocket on Mars, right? Like those two things are, you know, literally and figuratively in, um, in different, you know, galaxies or solar systems, right? So that's, that I think is the, 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 the point of a human pursuit. And, you know, as you said, people, you know, the, the utopian, uh, you know, simpletons kind of get carried away with, okay, yep, this thing, whatever it is, uh, AI, and, you know, Bitcoin is guilty of this too, you know, Bitcoin, whatever, is, is going to solve all the problems, and that's not the point. The point is that it's going to introduce a higher quality of problem so that we're not, um, you know, squabbling in the dirt for... Uh, no, that's really well put, too. Scraps. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, we say Bitcoin fixes this, and, and we think it's going to fix a lot of these things. I, I'm convinced. But that, but it, does, it doesn't fix all the problems in the world. It doesn't create... It's not supposed to. And I hope exactly. it doesn't. It, yeah. it, 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 it fixes the problems of a broken money system, which is what we were talking about earlier early in this in the show with the examples that both sailor and musk uh were, were giving this is what this is what it fixes and now with that fixed thing with that new model with that new tool there are so many more things we can do it doesn't automatically do all those things for us bitcoin doesn't think for us it doesn't it doesn't build automatically structures that last forever that make us happier to live in that's upon us but we can now do these things with the benefit of a tool that allows us to deploy our energy and our and our minds in a better in a better manner.
totally. I, uh, there's other people up here. I, uh, you and I have been monopolizing the conversations. Questions for Alex or just other important things people want to add. Mickey, Terrence, I see you guys with your hands up. David and Dom, welcome to the stage. You guys can jump in too. And Brady, of course, if you've got anything. We've got about 10 minutes left in the show. Yeah, Alex, I found it. I find it interesting that you're you're focused on AI, so sort of forward looking, but at the same time doing that deep analysis on ancient warrior cultures. Well, someone to just take the mic. I think Terence was first. Oh, uh, Mickey's uh, asking you a question, and you can't hear him again. Lousy, unreliable technology. Okay. Give me one second. Uh, I'll be back. I'll be back. Okay. I'll be back. All right. Twitter, come on, guys. X. Sorry, if I call it X, will they stop punishing us with these? Poor features. This is something that they should really do a bit more work on. But I don't know what I don't know why the challenge is so hard. Um, I will say uh, there's a peer-to-peer uh, product called Keat.io uh, that people should check into. It's like a substitute for a whole lot of different things: Slack, Zoom, FaceTime, and in a sense, could also be a complement to to Twitter and we may want to see if we can simulcast to it. It's entirely peer to peer. So it completely protects your privacy. Everything's encrypted in it. And uh, it, it's been worked on for a long time by the team that's putting it together. I've tried, I've tried a few of these features of it, and I'm really impressed at how well it works, knowing that there is no server that you're connecting to. You are the server, you are the client. So I uh, took that opportunity of Twitter's failure to deliver their service to propose a peer-to-peer -peer alternative. Alex is back on stage. Mickey, do you want to try asking your question again and we can see if Alex can hear you? Yeah, so I, I just wanted gotcha. to hear Alex's perspective on, so he's, he's forward-looking with the AI, but also doing some deep analysis on ancient warrior cultures with another project. So just, just wanted to see how, how his thoughts on how, you know, warrior culture, Bitcoin, AI intertwine. Yeah, man, that's a question that requires a whole book, <laughs> which comes out in two months. <laughs> um, I mean, it, it, hmm, how do I answer this? I mean, they, they, I guess what I've tried to extract from the research on the warrior cultures is, is principles and virtues. And Brady and I were talking about this yesterday is that, um, one thing that will never change is the principles and the virtues uh, that are important to live by. Technology can change, you know, the, the things we use change, the monetary substrate can change, all this sort of stuff. But um, the virtues that build a beautiful culture um, or the virtues that orient uh, civilization towards excellence, beauty, greatness, you know, that, that make civilization ascendant are timeless. Um, things like courage, things like justice, things like compassion, uh, things like respect, um, loyalty, self-control, honor, integrity, etc. Like these are the virtues that ha that were the things that the greatest ancient cultures and greatest medieval cultures and greatest feudal cultures had embedded within them and helped forge uh, the civilizations that we stand upon now. And likewise, these similar virtues are the same virtues that are in the DNA of the of the greatest structures and the greatest pieces of what we have in the West today, except we have started to decay this by um, uh, abdicating those virtues, abdicating responsibility, abdicating loyalty, um, abdicating uh, justice, uh, you know, laughing at courage. You know, there's a great uh, C.K. Chesterton quote, which is, you know, we, we laugh at those with, um, oh, what was it, S something to do with, uh, you know, courage and bravado like um and you know we wonder why we have um you know men without chests today you know like sort of you know people who will not stand up um so anyway to, to sort of say that is um to try and tie it all together is those principles are, are timeless and you know all the other things will change um and if we can uh take those principles um and live with them we can more accurately and better i guess leverage whether it's Bitcoin as a monetary substrate or, you know, AI as a tool. I, I don't know which order to call upon you guys and I trust you to go in the order. I guess Terrence has come off. So thinks oh, yeah, I'll jump in, um, Alex. Um, so I'm curious with uh, the spirit of Satoshi, I'm, I'm assuming that a lot of this was built, you know, for noobs, right? And no coiners so that they can understand and get 
quick answers to Bitcoin's you know properties and all the things that we know. I'm curious how evergreen it is versus somewhat current, or does it just steer the person asking the question into what's important versus answering their question specifically? And what I mean by that is, you know, like lots of new people don't really know yet the question to ask, so it ends up being a little bit more superficial. Like, um, so for example, hey, uh, is Craig Wright Satoshi? So does the spirit of Satoshi just ignore Craig Wright and just go, okay, the user's basically asking about who Satoshi is, which, which a lot of new people ask. So does it sort of just steer them in like, well, look, here's what we know, but more importantly, it doesn't matter who Satoshi is. What's important is blah, 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 blah. Uh, the, the latter. Um, we, we did just as a joke initially, we hard coded um, a series of funny responses to the Craig Wright one, just, just that one specifically, which was things like uh, one liners like, who's that? Um, or like, uh, I am embarrassed to be associated with this person, et cetera, et cetera. Just, just, we do that for fun. But yeah, gen generally speaking, it'll try and like, uh, understand the, the question behind the question. Um, but you know, once again, that is, a that's something that, um, is really difficult to, uh, entrain because, you know, at some, some points, it'll like really do a good job of like understanding the question behind the question because there'll be, you know, something in the training set that, um, you know, might be related to that kind of question in the past and there'll be some sort of answer that, you know, influences that, et cetera, et cetera, whatever the, um, you know, the, the pattern web is in the back end uh, will influence that. But sometimes it'll come up with something stupid and it'll try and like answer more literally, which, yeah, th there, there is no clear and defined solution but the attempt is to do more of the latter of what you said yeah because you know like with um something like um amazon's alexa I, I don't know how much llm they use and if if at all because um i'm part of this team where where we answer um and i specifically just answer bitcoin and crypto questions and most all of the questions which you would laugh at are all very um, superficial and very basic and you know should i buy bonk coin and you know things like that um so i have fun answering all this stuff because i want to direct people to bitcoin and and inform them but you can't get you can't deviate too much from answering it specifically you can't really say look here's why um you need to avoid crypto in general it's like no you just have to specifically answer their question about bonk coin yeah interesting uh, the the training process we took was more different. So when, so we have question answer examples in the data set, which is if you asked, should I buy bonk coin? The response is far more nuanced as an example. So that increases the probability that if the model is asked that it will answer something more nuanced in the way that we've tried to train it. So, yeah. And right, let's get these last couple of questions and uh, David and Brady, I, again, I don't know the order that you guys raised your hands in. So. Just be gentlemen. I'm next. All right. Um, did we lose Brady? Yes, we did lose Brady. Oh, Brady. oh, oh my God. God. No, you're, Brady, you're back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, so you heard my growl? Okay. I get so frustrated and day after day using spaces. I mean, you guys, Jacob, you, <laughs> you've been doing it for like three years every single day. I'm not even on every day and I can't, I can't be patient enough to handle this. Um, so anyway, really important project. I'm proud to be a sponsor of the project. Um, I made a contribution via Geyser, uh, geyser.fund last week. And there's a really cool Bitcoin trading cards collaboration going on. Um, and they have created this really awesome spirit of Satoshi series. So there's some really cool rewards there for uh, contributing to the Spirit of Satoshi project. I totally encourage you guys to at least go check it out uh, and see well, see what it's all about, especially if you haven't been to Geyser.Fund yet. It's also a great project. So uh, the reason I'm contributing to the project is, one, I, you know, Alex is, is a good friend, and I believe in stuff that he works on. He's a principled person. Um, and obviously AI, and, well, let's just call it machine learning, is, um, is becoming more and more imp important and useful in our lives. And I see a future where we'll have models that are kind of specified to certain niches of, uh, of learnings. Uh, whereas like a general model like chat GPT 
doesn't have all the context and nuance uh, to understand or answer Bitcoin questions accurately. Um, and so this model will be able to do that. So Alex, in the future, do you think that these models uh, will be created that have sort of specific niche focuses um, and, and you know, people from those are trying to learn those disciplines uh, will use those models to educate themselves as opposed to like a general chat GPT type model? 100%. So I think the future is specialized models. You cannot, so, so, they, so there are computational limits um, on things like uh, data set size, parameter size, and uh, relevance and response, right? So <clears throat> if you try and make a model that knows all the things and says all the things, um, the aggregate outputs that generally end up coming out start to become really watered down um, or really just sort of not accurate enough or useless in specific contexts, which is, you know, Bitcoin is a great, ex great example of that because, you know, on the surface, it seems like you can ask ChatGPT about Bitcoin. But those of us who understand Bitcoin realize that the, the gobble that comes out of it is just is like fucking useless. So I'm sure in other industries, could be homeschooling, could be neuroscience, could be recruitment, could be whatever, those people who are in the know will ask ChatGPT something and be like, okay, well, this is just a general stupid response that, you know, feels like I'm reading a Wikipedia page. So it's not contextually meaningful or relevant enough for the specific domain that I'm in. So I 100% believe that that's where things are going to go. Now, will the normies um, use those specialized models? Probably not. I, I get the sense that the normies will probably default to things like ChatGPT in the same way as they default to like Google and whatever the first response on Google is. But people who have an interest uh, you know, around a particular idea, topic, theme, domain, they will find their way to these more specialized models and they will get depth um, and context in that particular uh, domain. So basically, yes, is the long way of saying that. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Um, I think we lost our other questioner, and and we and we've come to the end of our t our, our time. So we'll we'll move to we'll move to. <laughs> Tell me, you, you you must have got rid of them. <laughs> Tom was like, let me call him quickly no, before you fucking uh, ask question. I'm out for a walk on a beautiful sunny day. I, I actually didn't sleep at all last night. I was telling, and Jacob said, "Well, Tomer, if you don't want to fall asleep while hosting the show, why don't you go for a walk?" And it turned out to be the best advice Jacob's given me all day. Uh, and so I've just been having this glorious walk and I'm still about 10 minutes from my house. So I would gladly take another question. If people want to keep, uh, keep the show going for the next 10 minutes, uh, as I continue my walk, I'm happy to. Uh, I'm done. Um, oh, all right. Well, so, uh, we, we need questioners. Uh, I feel like I've maybe spent my, spent my questioning. I, maybe, maybe I will just, uh, do one thing to, which is to try to bring it back to Bitcoin and, and one of the questions that Brady and I had in our conversation last night, it was a, it was a open space for beginner questions and newbie questions. And one of the people said, like, when, when artificial intelligence gets advanced enough, isn't it going to create a better coin that has artificial intelligence somehow attached to it than Bitcoin? And, and, and I, I think, you know, we, <laughs> there, there were two pushbacks. I, I wouldn't mind hearing anything you want to add to to it alex is one was well we don't know exactly when we're going to get agi or if we're going to get it or what it's going to be able to do and two uh, and brady offered this answer which which was it, if it's really smart it'll probably use bitcoin rather than try to create a new bitcoin on its own because if you have all these agis out there each creating their own coin we end up with that mess of shit coins uh, but <laughs> what an agi would really want is something that, something that it's exist whose existence it can verify right? like, and an agi can verify the existence of bitcoin it can't verify the existence of the physical world it, it lives in cyberspace um and and one thing it would recognize is that it can't it can possess bitcoin and no other agi can steal the bitcoin from it because it's computationally impossible to overwhelm the security measures of bitcoin uh, but I, if, if there's other people who want to I'm just trying to tie all these conversations together here. If there's other people who want to weigh in on that, by all means. Yeah, um, I, mean, <clears throat> I mean, notwithstanding the fact that I think AGI is a red herring and a scam, um, you know, we can discuss why. Um, you, you know, the whole point of Bitcoin is that it's, uh, you know, to, to break Bitcoin, you have to break the laws of physics um, and the laws of uh, social coordination amongst human beings. And those two things are never going to happen, right? So, like, 
you know, Satoshi realized that you can't get 10 people to agree on where to have dinner. You are definitely not going to get 100,000 nodes to agree on making a change. Um, that's why Bitcoin is immutable. Like it, it is, it is a social phenomenon in that sense, and that makes it um, extraordinarily powerful. Layer on, you know, Alex and mining Madera, computation. And Madeira, we got 13 people to have dinner together, and it turned out to be a disaster. Well, that, that's right, and who, that's because we. <laughs> but that wasn't because we had 13 people and dinner together. That was because of the fucking restaurant. But yes, I'm with you. Um, but that that's sort of you know that that's something that um you know. A, a hypothetical AGI is uh, is never going to um, contravene. Um, in saying that, uh, just the AGI thing, if I may for one second just say that it is, um, it is a gross misunderstanding of how intelligence functions um, and what generality actually means. It is like a human being is able to do things like run, eat, write, talk, sing, laugh, dance, like all of these things, like heal, you know, like, you, you know, if you get cut and your body actually fucking heals itself, it's absolutely miraculous. Like, the body can do all of these things extraordinarily well, uh, thanks to millions, potentially billions of years of uh, evolution. You know, we are sort of the, the tip of the, uh, the, the finger, the, the fi we're the fingertip of life, right? Like, we're, we're right at the very edge. Um, what they're finding in the AI space, and this is like a, a great example of, um, you know, the, the nerd's misunderstanding of like the holistic nature of uh, intelligence and existence is that AI is very computationally strong, you know, and human beings, we are computational. Like we can do math, you know, seven times seven is 49. So I can compute, but I'm not as good as you a just machine. That, though. You didn't actually do the computation. Now. You just referred to a memorized table. Probably. You, you probably. You did probably. 7, 14, 21, 28, you know, all the way up. Probably. Um, it's, besides, it's, it's a little besides the point. And I, yeah. I do want to give it, I should shut up because I want to give so, other people like David a chance. Yeah, the, 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 the point here is that um, the, the, the whole AI space is trying to imply that all intelligence is computational, which is, uh, which is wrong. Um, and even if it was, the more layers of computation you add and string together, you get what's called the, um, the generalization problem, which is you then need some sort of bureaucratic layer or sort of governance layer in the intelligences. So, you know, the chat, uh, OpenAI tried to do this with GPT-4. Is GPT-4 is actually 16 smaller models that are strung together that will answer specific things and they'll route the question to the right uh, sub-model. And then their idea was to take that same infrastructure, so one governing agent with uh, 16 models, and then scale that up to more and more and more. But the more they did that, the more they found that the system really, really, really slows down, and the cost of computation goes through the fucking roof, and you get this sort of slowdown in generalization. And one might say, oh, yeah, well, that's now, you know, you sort of fast forward that 100, 200 years or whatever, but where you sort of end up is that, you end up creating um, less uh, depth, and this ties into what Brady asked before about specialization. You get less depth and you get more generalization, which means computation actually gets worse, um, but other facets become better. And the, the joke, I believe, at the end of all of this is AGI is just a human being who is good enough at a bunch of things and if we were to ever create artificial general intelligence, it would just be a human. So um, you may as well just go and have babies now because you're actually able to create AGI and all this other shit is like one big fucking run around for no reason. Do it. Have babies. David, welcome back. I know you had a question before. David Hill, I see your hand up. If you can't hear me. I'll uh, move on to Gregory, and hopefully we'll... Uh, and you had your hand up too, Jacob. Are you okay? Because I think I also saw... Gregory. No, I'm good. I wanted to give David and Gregory a, an opportunity. Yeah, let's uh, go. So, yeah, no worries. Okay. okay. Hey, uh, uh, Alex, I'm a huge fan. Um, happy uh, to see what you're up to here. Um, a couple of things. One, uh, like, as far as, like, the format that you're saving the spirit of Satoshi stuff, is that going to be like parquet or like something that we can ingest and, uh, you know, some other, you know, art thing. Because I think the thing for me anyway about Bitcoin is that we're reimagining the idea of the individual, right? So at the end of the day, you're going to want to take your very uh, individual uh, 
solipsistic self and like plug it into your shit, right? And so I've got my lived experience. I've got that. It, you know, society's been trying to crush the individuality out of us. And, uh, you know, uh, thank you, Elon. Thank you, Bitcoin. It seems like the pendulum swinging back. Thank you, uh, Spetsky. Uh, so I want to ask you about uh, that and sort of like how do I ingest into sort of my own LLM? I mean, that'll be a question of um, economic, I guess, uh, value, right? So if you wanted to build your own personal LLM, you know, you, the, the challenge is going to be gathering up all the data, then running the computer and, you know, doing all that sort of stuff. And, you know, maybe for someone like, uh, you know, Michael Saylor, who wants to burn a million bucks on doing that, um, you know, it might be fun to do, but like for the average person, it just might not be, um, worth well, the endeavor. Something like a Bitcoin development company might do. Cause I think right now everybody's like, what the fuck's a Bitcoin development company? <laughs> <laughs> that's essentially the, the role that we're playing is that we're saying, okay, instead of every Bitcoin company doing this themselves, we've kind of done it. And then if Bitcoin companies want to work with us, we can help uh, embed this uh, model into their uh, infrastructure, essentially. So, um, you know, we're, we're still early days in this, you know, maybe in five years, um, you know, when computational uh, uh, costs come down further, maybe when there's more available data sets that are more, um, specialized and tuned and there's uh, frameworks for taking raw data and transforming it into a format that language models can uh, be trained on and ingest like all of this sort of stuff is happening and it's in flux like just you know to give you an idea it's we've got such a huge quantum of data um from you know austrian economics from you know we partnered with mises uh institute and you know from all the bitcoin podcast books and essays and we've got everything it's so much shit but to train the model, we were only able to use, like, from, from a quantum standpoint, less than 1% of that uh, data to train the model um, effectively. So, you know, th there's, there's always going to be more data, more information out there. And that, you know, to, to what Thomas said earlier today is, like, th fundamentally, there's more information in a single ice cube uh, than, you know, any AI could ever hope to sort of synthesize. Um, but, like, you know, in terms of just raw text based um, data, even that is something that um, is far grander than what any um, model could ever uh, ingest. But to, to sort of bring it back to you, like one of the net outputs of what we're doing is going to be a refined uh, data set that we will open source that anybody can then go and uh, add to how they train their models. So maybe w what we'll do is we'll stealth orange pill the future open source models because people are always just rolling out new open source models, you know, shit's always coming out. And I, I think what we're going to do with that data set is we're going to put it up on Hugging Face and we're going to call it uh, Economics 101. Um, and it'll just be basically Austrian economics and Bitcoin stuff in there. So most people don't look into the data set when they grab shit off the shelf in the open source space and train it. So they'll accidentally uh, entrain a bunch of Bitcoin data into you know the new open source model. So that's like one of the sneaky ways uh, we might be able to do it. But you as an individual can take that uh, and use it if you wanted to take on the endeavor of training your model. Spesky, that was uh, freaking awesome. I know uh, David had a question. Uh, if you could just give us Spetsky slam and bash Sam Altman for like 30 seconds, I'd love that. But you don't have to. <laughs> well, all I know about Sam Altman is that he tried to rape his sister. So, uh, you know, that's a great idea for, uh, <laughs> for building and for leading an AI company. Oh, all right, let's, let's maybe move on from that allegation. I, I have no idea if it's true or not. David. Well, it's totally true. He's, okay. he's fucking, his sister is like wow. on Twitter and she's like, my brother tried to rape me and just everyone ignores it. Well, it's still an allegation, right? I just want to be clear here <laughs> on the Twitter spaces. Uh, David, giving you another shot here. Hopefully everything's working for you now. Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome. Good afternoon. And yeah, it's, is, my, is it working? It's been super glitchy. Yeah, Can we you hear, hear me? You. We hear you. All right, awesome. So I was going to... I had a question a while ago. I don't even honestly don't even remember what my question was on anymore. But I, I think the last you know I, I heard you guys talking about um, potentially an AI creating a new version of Bitcoin or something similar to that, and it kind of got me thinking about the conversation we were having yesterday with some of the uh, meme meme coin guys. I was trying to I was getting them to try to help me understand like what is meme coin like how, how does that even make sense. 
And it, it's interesting because as I as I start to understand meme coin, it helped me better understand Bitcoin. At least this is my, my perspective of it. But the main difference is like the reason Bitcoin is valuable is because people say it's valuable and believe it's valuable. But the difference is that Bitcoin has the uh, the the scarcity because it, there's there's only a certain amount of it. Um, correct. So the way I look at it is like like I have a, a like a like a Rolex watch as an example. So I have a Rolex watch that I bought in I don't know two thousand and eight or something. It was uh, a GMT. I paid like eighty five hundred dollars for it. Right. I still have the same watch and it's worth almost fifteen thousand dollars now. Now that does not happen with most watches, only a very small percentage of watches that actually happens. Why? Because it's a Rolex watch. It's a piece of steel. But to me, that's that's Bitcoin. And it's also mean coins in a way. And I'm not I'm not saying suggesting anybody will get mean coins. I, I don't I, you know, I, I, I but th does that make sense? Am I am I on am I on track with what I'm saying right now? Or maybe someone's going to say, no, no, you're way off base. What are your thoughts on that? I mean, I mean, I'm, I, I, I kind of lost the question. So what's the What's what's the question? I think the the question is why are meme coins not as valuable as Bitcoin? Oh, what is that the question? Sorry, there was no. I guess there wasn't real. My question was a while ago. Like I said, I don't remember the question, but I was giving you guys uh, my 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 uh, hypop my my hypothesis, I guess, on what Bitcoin is. Which is that it's a a better meme coin, basically, or. Uh, well, it helped me to understand the value of uh, because the reason I brought that up is because somebody made a comparison earlier or suggested that in the future AI or or, or quantum computing will create mm -hmm. another version of Bitcoin. But how difficult would it be to do that? It would be almost impossible unless everybody buys into it, right? Correct. Correct. Yeah, and you know the 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 I guess the the benefit of Bitcoin is you know and there's many people have written about this uh, is that it was founded at a time when nobody thought anything like that was possible. So it was a zero to one moment. Then you had the the disappearance of the founder, the the growth of the network, the fact that it you know filtered through and all this sort of stuff that was like all path dependent. So like the one thing we can't do is we can't go back to two thousand eight and redo it. So like. Unless we have a time machine, nobody's going to make something better than Bitcoin. And that's Bitcoin's ultimate protection is time. Um, and, you know, no matter what you do from an AI standpoint, you're not going to break the laws of physics and you're not going to go back in time to recreate yeah. it.